Okay, in the last video, uh, Conditions and Circumstances 3, we looked at how lighting impacts our fish and fishing. For this one, uh, Conditions and Circumstances 4, we're delving into water current and then dissolved oxygen. Water movement or current has multiple effects. Uh, foremost among them, current affects fish mobility, which acts by more tightly positioning fish on structure and cover, which in turn makes their whereabouts and movements more predictable. Some fish species are better adapted to current than others. Um, of the black basses, largemouths are the least adapted to uh, operating in current. But like most fish predators, they make good use of it where and when they find it. The advantage gained is that small fishes are much more greatly affected by current than larger fishes are. Uh, current effectively limits the movements of small fishes, uh, essentially boxing them in and putting them at much greater risk to predators. Uh, thus, current is one of the most powerful feeding cues that predatory fish, like bass, experience. They know in their bones to take advantage of it. Current essentially acts by signaling fish that they are about to get fed. Conversely, the shutting off of a current can signal predatory fish that, with the advantage lost, their energy might better be conserved. Current rules in rivers and pretty much regulates fish activity on river-run reservoirs, as well as um, inshore waters in the salt with the coming and going of, of the tides. Tributary inflows can be particularly good on lakes and ponds, uh, drawing fish and influencing their positions and, and activity. Current is the critical feature in all these places, uh, directly affecting food chain activity and uh, the associated activity, location, and positions of, of fish. Other places that may develop currents are topographic constrictions, such as canals or channels, uh, narrows, that move water either by natural flow or wind generated. See video fishing journal number 13 for an example of how wind generated currents can greatly affect our fishing. Another uh, great example was a canal I used to fish uh, that moved water via gates or, or locks that allowed boats to traverse the, the canal sections. There was a large pond, a, a long defunct marina, connected to the canal via a short uh, narrow channel. When water was released through a lock somewhere up or down the canal, water flowed into that pond. It then backed up in the pond, and after an hour or so, it flowed back out. Each pass, each oscillation of flow, created a fairly strong current through that narrow channel. It would build until it was strong enough that the silver sides and, and young of several species of fish, the prey fish there, were forced to take refuge along the riprap that lined the edges of that channel. No sooner did those little fishes get pressed against that bank than the carnage started. Smallmouths and walleyes, along with white bass and an occasional largemouth, would rip into those boxed-in little fish. The fishing was great for that roughly 20 minute period until the current began to relax uh, and the little fishes once again were freed from that current trap. And the fishing would die along with it. Uh, those predators were certainly still in the vicinity, but they didn't show themselves or respond to lures with any frequency until the current flowed again. Uh, fish are not stupid. Uh, the complexity and severity of the world they live in doesn't allow for it. They know when to act and when to lay low. Uh, current can act like, literally like an on and off switch. Another aspect of wind generated current uh, that, can, that can affect fish activity is that wind can push warm surface waters onto downwind shorelines, stacking warmed water on those shorelines, especially useful in the colder water periods of the transition seasons. 
if such warmed water stacks up against areas that have good, good habitat, cover and prey, amazing fishing periods can result. Um, and I, I've come to call these times and places carnage zones. Good uh, because that's what they become. <laughs> She's a feisty thing. Whoa, whoa, single hook now. Let's take her in carefully. Come on, little honey. Come on, little honey. Oh, yes. Changes in water levels have a major impact on fish activity and in particular on their location. Water level changes can happen through either short or longer term events. Uh, in, in reservoirs that move water for energy production, water level changes uh, tend to occur over a matter of days. And the coming and going of tides in coastal tidal waters or from storm runoff can occur in a matter of hours. Reservoirs holding water for uh, irrigation or metropolitan use tend to see longer term changes as water is drawn off over the course of a season um, and then recharged over winter. A similar thing happens in smaller lakes and ponds too, uh, naturally, as water evaporates over the summer, leaving autumn water levels much lower. Regardless of how they happen, the thing to know is that fish are highly sensitive to water level changes. Uh, I suspect that fish are so deeply sensitive to water level changes because of the ancient risk of stranding, in which fish can be left behind, stranded in water that's too shallow, if they fail to follow the changing, uh, in this case, dropping water level. Fish commonly exhibit the opposite behavior in rising water. Uh, moving into the shallows, often well up into newly flooded shorelines. I remember catching pike and carp from under shopping carts and behind light poles in a flooded grocery store parking lot. Fish make these moves for several reasons. High water can bring increases in current, which can push fish into calmer water along shorelines and especially into cover along those shorelines. Uh, high water can bring muddy, turbid water into a system too, which also generally moves fish shallower. Finally, access to prey fishes that also move up into those shallows, into that shallow cover during rising water can be a big draw for predators. The rule of thumb is to expect fish to move shallow with rising water and drop out away from the shorelines, get the heck out of there with falling water. When they drop back, they don't usually change depth greatly, but will abandon those dangerous shallows as the levels fall. Uh, such movements up and out again are known to occur nearly year round, uh, seen even in water temperatures down into the low 40s. Falling water levels have another effect that can create an almost binge-like feeding response in predatory fishes like bass. As shallow areas drain away, smaller fishes must abandon their, these, their formerly safe shallow cover zones, uh, exposing them to predators. This may be a subtle change on a seasonal basis and on larger water bodies, but, uh, but still happening. Uh, but under intense drought periods on small waters, prey fishes and predators can end up consolidated, squeezed in together in remaining pockets and cover, resulting in carnage zones. Okay, oxygen. Uh, Oxygen is, of course, essential to most life forms. Oxygen doesn't, however, dissolve into water from the air very readily. So the vast majority of oxygen in water bodies is produced in-house. Uh, just like everywhere else on the planet, this is done via photosynthesis by plants. In aquatic systems, both rooted plants called macrophytes
and microscopic plants in the water column called phytoplankton produce the oxygen. Now, oxygen depletion, uh, severe enough to stress fish, it is not all that common, especially for largemouth bass, a, a fish fairly well adapted to low oxygen levels. But oxygen depletion can affect fishing when in the extreme. Uh, such events are most likely to occur in over-fertilized waters, usually those that receive heavy agricultural or, or urban runoff. Such waters often develop excessive aquatic vegetation growth, um, rooted and or plankton blooms. Two things are at work here that can cause excessive oxygen depletion. First, water bodies hold less and less oxygen as water temperatures rise. And bacteria numbers that decompose organic materials explode. These two factors together, high water temperatures and a major decomposition event of all that vegetation, can deplete water oxygen levels down to uh, even dangerous levels to fish. Major decomposition events occur most commonly in the early fall as the sun angle gets lower and the days shorter, causing that aquatic vegetation to die back. Uh, extended periods of abnormally muddy, turbid water or extended periods of deep cloud cover can shade aquatic plants, causing plant die-offs then too. In some overly fertilized waters, excessive plant growth may become so dense that the upper canopy shades the, the underlying leaves, killing them. The dense canopy can block wind mixing as well, resulting in heavy decomposition beneath. Lake or pond managers, uh, overzealous in treating for nuisance weeds, can create uh, major decomposition events as well. Uh, coupled with high su summer uh, water temperatures, oxygen levels can drop precipitously. From the fish perspective, respiration from heavy decomposition events can lower water pH as well, making it more acidic, which acts by inhibiting the ability of a fish's blood to carry oxygen. Another event that can cause oxygen level drops can happen in, on highly fertile, uh, called eutrophic waters, that thermally stratify, that is, develop a thermocline. Cold, dense water beneath the thermocline in such waters is often nearly devoid of oxygen due to bacterial decomposition of all that organic detritus that collects up in the lake basin um, and the lack of mixing of that cold, dense water with the uh, warmer upper layers of, of lake water. In these waters, fish are relegated to the shallower layers uh, above the thermocline, uh, but, but strong winds can rupture the thermocline, triggering a seiche or a turnover, uh, bringing that deoxygenated water into the upper layers of the lake where the fish live. Again, these are relatively rare events for most waters most of the time, with some waters and some years being better or worse than others. More commonly, in heavily vegetated waters anyway, oxygen levels are known to yo-yo up and down on a daily basis. Levels rise through the day as sunshine fuels photosynthesis, and then those levels fall overnight when oxygen production shuts down and the fish and other creatures in that water body use the available oxygen. Levels then rebound again over the course of the next day as daylight returns. Fishes like largemouth bass that evolved in vegetated habitats can generally handle low oxygen levels, but over-fertilized waters may have bass laying low during particularly challenging periods of time. Uh, one way to check to see if your water is experiencing uh, stressful overnight oxygen levels, um, although far from foolproof, is to try fishing early in the morning. If the bite is good, then oxygen levels are probably not an issue. Signs that fish might actually be oxygen stressed are uh, fish holding and, and, and kissing the surface film, where oxygen levels are highest, um, being in contact with the air, or, or having fish stacking up into flowing water, uh, where they can use what's called ramjet ventilation. 
which is passively letting more water flow through the gills without having to expend the energy to pump it through. I've never seen this in bass. Um, uh, they're more apt to just lay low, uh, but it's a common behavior for oxy oxygen deprived trout. In regions where water bodies ice over, uh, by late winter, heavy snow cover can create dangerous conditions in shallow, fertile, usually weedy waters. Blocked sunlight, stopping photosynthesis, and oxygen use by all the critters under that ice and, and snow cap could result in a winter kill. Uh, some kills are partial, uh, with some parts of the, the pond faring better than others. Uh, some kills can be nearly complete, with usually the largest fish succumbing first. Since winter killed fish soon rot and sink to the bottom, uh, waters at risk should be checked right at ice out to get an accurate bead on, on how they fared the winter. Um, I've had to inform fellow anglers um, happily casting away in a certain pond that, uh, hate to tell you this, but um, this one's dead. <laughs> Give it a few years. Okay, uh, again, despite all this talk of death and destruction, oxygen depletion enough to stress warm water fish species is relatively rare uh, and most likely to occur again in over-fertilized and, and usually smaller water bodies. I try to make a habit of not assuming the worst when I'm fishing. If I'm having trouble catching, there are usually more productive tacks to take than making doomsday assumptions. Okay, I I'm going to add one more last thing here uh, before we close out our look into uh, conditions and circumstances. I'm not going to say much about lunar or solar periods. Uh, supposed best fishing times that we can get off a table um, because I've paid scant attention to them. Um, I say scant because I have spent some time tracking lunar influence on my fishing success and considerable time following and collecting data on lunar influence on spawn, uh, bass spawning behavior. In my albeit limited experience and from what little there is in the scientific literature, uh, I believe that immediate conditions affect fish most. Uh, the large-scale catch-alls like the, uh, from the astro tables overlook the more important and uh, more fickle day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, maybe what the tables offer is the promise of simplicity. For me, on any spring day, I'd rather plan a fishing trip on a good warming trend, preferably with some good afternoon overcast rolling in, uh, uh, or, or for good dark prefrontal frontal conditions on a summer day, than to be focused on some specific best times listed in a chart that was plotted years in advance. Now, I'm talking fresh water here. Uh, in the salt, following the moon-induced tide cycle can greatly affect success, fishing success. But this does not appear to be the case in freshwater water bodies, um, e even the largest of them. And believe it or not, I'm not going to cover weather uh, per se in these videos either. Even though weather is what creates many of these conditions we face out on the water in the first place. Instead, we focused on the conditions themselves what specifically the fish respond to, and the circumstances that cause them. Uh, this way we can decipher what's important, regardless of how those conditions came about. I do want to address barometric pressure, though, uh, because it's so often mentioned amongst anglers. I cannot say whether barometric pressure, per se, has a direct effect on fish feeding activity or catchability, as far as I am currently aware, it's not been definitively shown that freshwater fish respond directly to barometric pressure changes. This does not mean that it's not possible. Um, I must say I sure love a good low pressure system moving in, especially in summer when the sky is darkening. But I have to ask, is it the barometric pressure or is it the sky darkening? To be honestly rigorous about it, I'm not sure anyone has the data that has adequately factored in immediate sky and water conditions, much less other important uh, circumstances, that would allow us to separate 
them from barometric pressure. While angling is not a great sampling method uh, due to all the often unseen variables that are present, I have made some pretty consistent observations that have bolstered my confidence that it's the immediate conditions at hand that are the acting forces, uh, taking precedence over things such as barometric pressure and cylinder tables. The Colorado Front Range, where I fish, brings some pretty consistent weather patterns uh, due to the topography. We generally see bright sun in the mornings that then gives way to building cumulus clouds by mid-afternoon that can develop into heavy thunderstorms. Along with these intense afternoon storms comes a notable drop in barometric pressure. I can tell you that the morning fishing under those bright skies can be darn tough, uh, even though we know a good barometric pressure drop is coming on. I can also tell you that the fishing gets so much better after those clouds roll in. Why? Well, that's what these Conditions and Circumstances videos are, are about. To see this weather pattern in action, see Video Fishing Journals numbers 5 and 6, especially number 6. So here's what I'm most confident in saying in terms of weather fronts that fronts essentially bring two key conditions changes with them. Changes in temperature and lighting. Those changes are something that I and the fish can surely see and respond to. So I've come to pay more attention to specific conditions at hand, conditions that just happen to come along with barometric pressure changes. Okay, these videos on conditions and circumstances numbers one through four should give us a bead on how fish respond to some important environmental changes. Uh, changes we anglers see come and go seasonally, daily, hourly, and, and even momentarily at times. If I left something out that you found important in your fishing, uh, you know, let us know. Uh, my plans now are to work on the next tackle know-how piece on lure presentation, considering, of course, the fish side of things, um, along with some on-the-water video fishing journals, of course. Um, uh, ice out is here, and um, I'm, I'm dying, dying to get out. Okay, till next time, till next video, um, we'll see ya.